Hey, this is the Better Life Podcast with Brandon Turner and Cam Cathcart. This is a special Friday episode we call Cash Flow Fridays, where we interview people on one specific investment strategy that produces phenomenal cash flow in this market. This show is meant to be short, sweet, to the point, so you can implement it right away into your life. Without further ado, let's get to the episode. You know, one of the hardest lessons I've learned in building my real estate business is this. I can't do everything on my own. And trust me, I have tried. Like, I was that guy wearing all the hats, acquisition, property management, marketing. I haven't tried my hand at bookkeeping, which by the way, is not a great idea. It was not until I embraced like the art of delegation that things really started to take off for me. I actually remember hiring my very first virtual assistant. And then I realized right away, why did I wait so long to do this? And honestly, I was amazed at how great they were. They're better than me at most things they did, and in fact, that first VA is still with me today, 10 years later. Now, suddenly I had time to focus on bigger picture things, scaling the business, finding more deals, and honestly spending more time with the family. And that is why I'm excited to tell you about our sponsor today, HireTrainVA.com. So these guys have cracked the code on finding top tier virtual assistants for the real estate investing world. They go through a brutal selection process. Only one to 2% of applicants make it through, so you know you're getting the best of the best. And they've got this really cool draft board where you can actually handpick from the top talent that they've already sourced and vetted. It's like having your own personal dream team at your fingertips. And if you're unsure where to start or how to delegate right, they've got you covered with a free guide on a hundred plus tasks that you can start delegating today. Just head over to HireTrainVA.com. You know, I believe in them so much that their owner, Valentina Brega, is a friend of mine. I actually brought her on the podcast a while back it's on episode 42, so if you want to check that out, go go listen to a masterclass on how to hire and work with virtual assistants. So hey, if you want the fast track on hiring your first VA, but you don't know where to start, just shoot me a DM over on Instagram with the word delegate. Just delegate, and I'll hook you up with some of the same resources that transformed my business. Stop wearing all the hats and scale faster. Hire a VA, free up your time, and scale your business. Go to HireTrainVA.com or hit me up on Instagram with the word delegate. It's time to take that next step in your business. Now, back to the show. Ryan Muir, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, guys. It's Dude, excited to have you here. So quick bio, Ryan Muir, alongside his wife, have owned and managed various ventures, including franchises, I want to hear about that, rental homes, mobile home parks, RV parks, and self storage units. Their franchise business generated over $4 million annually. And in 2021, they shifted focus to real estate investing, expanding their holdings to over $8 million and building a property management company. But today specifically, man, uh, we're going to talk about one of those niches that you're in, something that's producing cash flow in today's market, because today's cash flow, I guess, cash flow Friday episode. So we're going to start with what we call the fast five. Let's start with the question I, I everybody already knows the answer to because I, because <laughs> I already said it. What's your name, man? Yeah. Name's Ryan Muir. All right. Tough last awesome. name, but don't feel bad if you get it wrong because most people do. Very question good. two, what is your niche? Niche. So yeah, short-term mm -hmm. rental, glamping. Hey, Ryan, real quick, do you say niche or niche? I say niche. Yes. That's yeah. a chalk up another yeah. one for Brandon. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Four, four, four up. Going. Yeah. Sorry. Started out in short-term rental. Then we've got a gigantic glamping and RV resort uh, as well and have ventured out into more long-term RV and mobile home as well. Very cool. Where do you do that at? Where's kind of your focus? Yeah, we're probably, we're all in Missouri currently, but we're branching out actively looking to go into Northwest Arkansas as well as further up towards Kansas City. Missouri, land of the free, baby. Best <laughs> state in the world. I'm not even sure if I've ever been there. Wait, no, I remember the Arch. That's all I know about Missouri. Dude. Yeah, there's a few emerging markets. I mean, we've, we've done really well here in Branson. Uh, honestly, it's been fantastic for us. Kansas City uh, is a great market as well. And then being here in Branson, we're only like an hour from all that Fayetteville, Bentonville, uh, Northwest Arkansas stuff. Cool. Love Number four. It. Number four, how much cash flow can one of these deals bring in? Yeah, well, depends on what you're asking. If you're asking for a cash on cash return, I mean, we're regularly getting in the mid 20s to our most recent one is projecting 38% in year one, even in this market. We just closed on that in March. So uh, very, very recent numbers to go off of there. Real, real quick, can you, uh, and we're going to ask more in, yeah. in a second, but like what, what was that most recent one? Was that a RV, mobile home? What, what was it? It is a super unique property, actually. It's a 31 acre property and it's a mixture of all kinds of things. So we have some traditional stick built 
houses on there. We've got 16 self storage units for boat storage. We've got 35 long term RV sites, 12 mobile home sites, which we own four of those. Uh, let's see if I left anything else. We're adding more to it. Uh, there was a lot of bare ground, you know, 31 acres. Yeah. There was a lot of extra. So we're currently adding five more sites and we'll probably end up doing some short term rental sites there for the RV section as well. But right now we're focusing on leasing that up on a month to month basis for long term rent. That's amazing. All right. Last question of the fast five. Would you recommend that kind of idea of glamping like RV parks, that kind of stuff to new investors? I would with a caveat of making sure that you're not the one trying to go in there and just do it all yourself because you will get burnt out quick and find that it's near impossible to do it all yourself on something like a 30 acre property. I see that happen a lot where people are asking, you know, how come I'm not making the right cash flow? Well, you're trying to do it all yourself and you're letting things fall behind and then you're just having to slack on rent and just doesn't do well. Makes sense. Got it. Awesome. So tell me, tell me more about, and it sounds like you kind of, you do a lot within that, but tell me more about just glamping the RV resort that you guys have uh, just recently, the embers that you just have opened up. Um, Just tell me a little bit more about that and how it works. Yeah. So the glamping RV resort, that's just started out as a side note with our real estate agent at the time. It was just getting us into our first nightly rentals. And we Mm. happened to mention, oh, we'd be interested in owning a campground someday. Well, he owned property right next to this one that we ended up closing on. He's like, hey, I think I know an abandoned campground. So long story short was we just went out there. There was only the bones left of this thing. It had been abandoned for decades. There wasn't much left of it. You could see some old roads and maybe a couple of pedestals here and there. A bunch of old derelict buildings, a little little scary to go through, to be honest. And (laughs) So we just started envisioning and the plan grew and grew and grew. I mean, from where we started thinking we would have what this thing would be to what it ended up being is far and away different. I mean, it's so much more than what we had envisioned of it now. So we've got uh, we we knew we wanted to combine not just glamping, but also have a high end experience for our viewers because it was seriously lacking here in Branson. There's a lot of RV parks here, but not very many that can fit these giant rigs. You know, these big old buses that are towing a boat or towing their get around vehicle. It's very difficult to get in and out of these places because we're in the Ozarks, a lot of hills. Mm -hmm. So this one, thankfully, is pretty much on the top of a hill where it's nice and flat. Mm -hmm. And so we got in there and now we've got 50 RV sites, 17 glamping tents and cabins of various types. Some of them were marketed as treehouse tents. They're on 10 foot raised platforms with private hot tub areas underneath, full bathrooms, they overlook the golf resort next door. So it's truly glamping. It's it's not just, you know, we put something up and, and hope it will do well. We've really created something that is unique and we know people are going to be wanting yeah. to go. In fact, we just opened our booking calendar and are already starting to receive bookings just a day after without even our full website up. So wow. it's been really awesome to see that take off already. Where, where in Branson is this one located? So we are like right in the heart of Branson on your way out to Table Rock Lake. Okay. So if you leave off the strip and head towards the dam, towards Table Rock Lake, we're just about halfway there. It's two, two miles to the strip, one mile to the lake. Cool. And, and one, one more question um, along these lines is how did you guys identify Branson or how would you identify this is a good place for a glamping RV resort? Yeah. So Branson as a whole, we started looking into after a couple of failed attempts on the Forgotten Coast in Florida. We had been out there. We'd actually, that was the very first offer we ever put in on a property was on a small RV park out there in Florida. And uh, we were on our way back, kind of had our our tail between our legs, having missed out on a couple of different deals out there. And we had just experienced an awesome visit here to Branson with our family. We've got four kids and it was the first time we'd been back to to Branson in over 10 years. And we had a phenomenal time. So we started thinking about it, started calling around, looking on the Bigger Pockets website for uh, agents and contacting an agent through the site. Ended up being a phenomenal guy. We're, we're good friends today uh, now that we all live in the same town. But that was kind of how we started thinking about it is we had a good experience here. We started looking into it and realized oh my gosh, there's 10 million visitors a year here. And I had no idea. 
And so yeah. um, wow. we found a, a great first deal. It was kind of that proof of concept. Once that took off and did better than we than we thought it would, we just went full bore. We started selling our other businesses and and going full scale into real estate after that. Hey, what was the franchise that you owned uh, or did you still own it? We don't anymore. We sold all of them. And so we used to own Napa Auto Parts stores, which is a far stretch from real estate. But yeah. we did that for 15 years. In fact, uh, bought, sold our houses, bought into that in 2008, right when everything was going into turmoil. Survived a lot of things, survived the economic downturn, survived some floods, uh, buying stores, selling stores, losing stores, buying more, you know, up and down a lot of the, a lot of the way. So maybe I can ask you this question. It's on real estate related, but it's, it's a popular topic right now with real estate investors. Is should I go buy a business or should I invest in real estate? So you clearly are choosing the real estate route. Why? So, like I said, we did that for 15 years. Auto parts in particular, I can speak to a lot because just had a lot of experience there. I worked for uh, the corporate side, genuine parts company before I owned our own stores. And it's very reliable. You can count on what you're going to have for sales, but it is super low margin. I mean, you were lucky to be getting four or five percent net on on your sales at the end of the end of the year. So along the way, we spent time learning how to be a good business owner. We spent a lot of time doing that whole working in your business versus on your business. Took a long time to realize that wasn't working out. So for the last, I don't know, five or seven years, we really were able to build and scale and, and do some good things there. Enough to where it made a whole lot of sense to sell on a high. We, we sold out of there the year after we had a record year, made it very marketable. We were able to sell for a great price. And that was kind of our seed money for jumping in to our first properties. Now we partner on everything. But in the first two years of real estate, and we've made double what we made in 15 years in the Napa Auto Parts business. So wow. will I go back? Nope. I'm, I'm stuck on real <laughs> estate for sure. Oh, that's amazing. Cool. All right. Let's, let's talk about the find finance topic as this question. I need a better name for the question. But basically, how do you find deals like this? And how do you find it? How do you find glamping? How do you finance glamping? Yeah, everything that we find is all through networking. We just tell, and I always say we, my wife and I are in this full time together. We've been married for 18 years together since before we graduated high school. So we've been working together and doing this together all along. Uh, but we just network with everybody, tell everybody what we're looking for. And that has brought the best deals every single time. I mean, we've tried to find our own on, on market, off market, calling up, you know, different agents throughout different parts of the of the country and, and trying to get something established. But honestly, that face to face communication, anytime we meet somebody or we put ourselves in the position to be at events. In fact, we're going to one tonight up in Springfield where we're out there meeting other people who are trying to do the same stuff. And that's how we get our deals. They, they call us up regularly and say, Hey, I've got this thing or that thing. Um, missed out on one this week because I didn't have enough uh, ready cash to, put into the pot. But when you get around people and you let them know, the stuff comes around. Very Love cool. it. Amazing. So uh, one of the, the purpose of this, the cash flow Fridays is to show that there's still cash flow out there. So like I just, I just bought a rental property. I left 60 something thousand dollars tied up into it. And mm -hmm. I'm cash flowing a grand total of $180 a month. So God, that's, that's what rough. 3%. Yeah, it's terrible. And you're, you're telling about a, a deal that you just bought that's 30, 30% uh, 30 cash on cash return. So yeah. can you just walk us through that deal? Um, kind of from start to finish? Yeah, like, absolutely. How, how you found it, what you paid for it, the money that you have in it, even like investors that are in on it, and then the cash flow that you're getting. Yeah, I love this deal because I want I want 10 more just like this. Uh, this one came to us from uh, an agent who knew we had the park here in Branson. He literally just came to the park that we were in the middle of building, found us and said, hey, are you guys interested in, in buying another one? He's a land agent who sold these folks a farm. They also had this RV park. This is the one that I described earlier with all of the, the, the homes, the RV section, the mobile section, the, the boat storage, all that. Honestly, we weren't that interested because we were just neck deep in this project. Didn't really give it the attention it deserved immediately. About two weeks later, we went and looked at it, knew it was a good deal right away. 
And so we started working up an LOI. We got it under contract ultimately at 650. So 650,000 for 30 acres, a five bedroom house, a one bedroom house, 35 RV sites, 12 mobile homes of which we own four and uh, all the self storage. I don't know if I said that already, but under contract at 650, it appraised for 839 as is. Wow. So immediately we got 189,000 in profit. Uh, we have a third, uh, $235,000 renovation budget. All of this is financed through a bank relationship that I've built over these few years. It's a local bank. I'm a firm believer of making local bank connections and relationships because prior to this one, it was hard to get these loans. And now I just call him up and say, Hey, Dustin, you know, I've got another thing. Let me send you my usual paperwork. And he's typically has me an answer the next day at this point. Um, as far as what we have into it, it's a flat 200,000. So 200,000 in none of our own money, my wife or I, but we have one capital partner. And so if you just kind of do the math there, they're still making over 18% cash on cash return, plus their equity position in this business that we have together. So they're happy. They're ready to find the next one with us. We're, we're, we're ready to reach out and find that next one and, and hopefully partner again. I love having been able to, to produce that for them and, and just want to continue to do that. And that project, we were anticipating year one, 28%. Uh, just doing the math over the first five months, uh, we're projecting about 36 at this point. So cash flow on that property is going to be over 70,000 in year one. And we're, we're looking that we'll be scaling up to at least 80,000 once we stabilize it. It's amazing. Yeah, super cool, man. Hey, what do you think the future looks like for glamping? Like, do you think this is, we're at a peak and it's going to drop now? Like, where do you see glamping headed? Yeah, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know it's still super popular right now, which is obviously why we're going into it. I want to say I can see how it could be a fad, but there's places out there that have been doing this for 10, 12 years already with hundreds of these tents that almost the exact same ones that we have. Mm -hmm. And they're doing great. In fact, the same supplier that supplied a lot of our tents for the property here in Branson, uh, they were just putting in another 75 or a hundred for this place out in Maine and they already have 75 or 100 out there. So clearly it's doing very well. Um, glamping, I see being strong, at least in the near future. It is a little bit of a premium for people. You know, if we go into some sort of economic downturn, it's not as though glamping is the cheap option. So mm -hmm. I do wonder about that with uh, the economic condition we're in right now and what could be looming out there. But can't worry too much about the future that's undetermined. So we're just pushing ahead and getting bookings yeah. you know. as long as social media is around glamping will be I around I right so, <laughs> yeah to post that picture um so what do you uh what do you think is the biggest challenge for you guys uh as you guys are are building this portfolio what what, what have you encountered that you'd say to somebody that wants to get into this you this need is to look out an easy answer because whether it's our giant glamping resort or that 30 acre property, both of them by far the hardest thing was wastewater. It, mm. You have got to figure out what's going on with your wastewater, whether you're in city limits or outside city limits, whether you have a department of natural resource rules that regulate your, so we have two wastewater systems on that 30 acre property. One is a la open lagoon system that discharges into a Creek, which some people might freak out about that. That sounds really <laughs> awkward and, and strange, but that's legit. And then we also have a septic system. One doesn't have to be regulated because we're underneath of their limits, that septic system, but that lagoon is a bear. Yeah. And in our project here in Branson for the glamping, we were, we had a city sewer connection on site, yet we are outside city limits. So after we had gotten all of our permits, fire permits, building permits, land disturbance permits from the state, everything lined up. I go to the city to get our, our sewer connection agreement. And they said, oh, wait a minute. No, no, you've got to be annexed into the city and then follow all of our permitting rules in order to connect to that city sewer. So then we go through this whole new process of stuff and it, it really almost destroyed the deal and just everything. It, it could have been terrible. Thankfully, 
uh, we had some common sense and the folks there in the city really helped us out by pushing through a different amendment uh, than what was written and we were able to hook up. But yeah, wastewater by far, check into that Yeah, anywhere you go. Yeah, that's, that's, something true. That we, that's true with mobile home parks too. I was going to say uh, we encounter the septic lagoons quite often. Uh, yeah. And we won't, we won't like uh, personally open our capital. We won't buy them now. They're not to say you can't learn from them and learn how to deal with them, but it's for that reason that they are, they are a bear to deal with. Yeah. And it's well, just, that's not the hard we've chosen. I got blessed <laughs> with a new friend here in Branson who is one of the wastewater operators for their plant here. And he has helped me out tremendously. So I know so much more about lagoons than I ever thought I would have to know. And honestly, now I come, I kind of see it as an opportunity because people Agreed. are staying away from them. And we've we've got some real resources on how to take care of them and, and rehab them and not have to go through that hundred thousand dollar dredging that you can run into. And I, I just went and looked at another park that they're trying to sell. And this person bought this park three years ago. It wasn't permitted for their lagoon and they spent ninety one thousand dollars to have to have it dredged wow. in, in like year one or year two. It just killed them. Can you explain to somebody that's a single family guy that his, I mean, I've dealt with septics before, but what, what do you mean by that? Like the wastewater, what, what do you mean? Yeah. So it's, it's basically, so most people are familiar with the septic system. The water drains into a tank and then it goes out into these laterals and it sinks into the, into your field, right? You have your septic yeah. field and it just dissipates through the ground. Well, in a lagoon system, it can be set up different ways, but it's basically an open pit. So instead of the tank being in the ground, your sewer goes out into this open pit where it does its thing. And it's supposed to be retained in there for a certain amount of time. All the bacteria do its thing. And by the time it actually flows out into the creek, it's supposed to be within certain limits of what's allowed to be discharged. So you have to do monthly testing. We have people that we hire for that. They go out there and they test that water coming out and make sure that it's within range that the Department of Natural Resources gives you. And so what happens over time, if it's not maintained correctly, is those discharge levels get super high. They flag you. They can literally just shut you down overnight if you're not very careful. Uh, in fact, we'd probably be in deep water with that project if I hadn't talked to them pre-purchase and had documented information that said, this won't be a problem for you. Just let us know after you've purchased and we'll get you your new permit. I have that in writing, but if I didn't, they would have shut us down after the fact mm -hmm. when they came through and said, oh, no, this is a big problem. I'm like, well, well you know, yeah, I, I have talked to you guys before. Yeah. I do have some information you might want to read through. Yeah, always get that conversations yeah. with the city in writing because, yeah. yeah, you don't. Yeah, permitting, all that stuff, as much as you can do email, better. It doesn't guarantee you success. They still might say, well, that was another guy. I don't I don't care. But Indeed. It is nice yeah. to have that backup. Love it. All right, Ryan, if you could answer, how would you answer this question? If there's one tip, what is the secret to success in glamping? Ooh, in glamping. If for glamping, you have got to create a very unique experience. It has to be unique. It can't be just a cookie cutter. Like, like all short-term rentals, a lot of the, the, the audience I'm sure is familiar with that. You're going to struggle if you create something mediocre. You have to create something new and exciting. Make it nice for people. Make them want to pay the extra money to come and see you. Yeah. Love it. Agreed. Cool, man. Well, thank you. This was phenomenal. Uh, any final advice, tips, et cetera, uh, from the listeners? Oh, man. Just just reach big. Go Go big or go broke. <laughs> or go yeah. go big and don't go broke, I yeah, guess, is, is my deal. advice. You know, the big the big deals, there's not a whole lot different to them. You know, a big deal versus a small deal. You know, do your due diligence, of course. Be be mindful of that. But, um, you know, you can branch out. You can go bigger. It re you really can. You'd be surprised. Love that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I want to connect with you at some point. Hey, sounds good, Cameron. I'd, I'd love that, man. Especially you got... You got a place out here, like you're ready to do something. That'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Anytime. All right, man. Where do people connect with you? Where do they find you at? What's your, uh, what's your place? Yeah, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, Roaming Home Ryan or Ryan Muir, uh, LinkedIn, all of that stuff. If you want to see the awesome updates on our projects, though, my wife's Instagram, Roaming Home <laughs> Heather, is the place to go. And uh, roaming, she posts regularly. Roaming Home Heather. Yep. Cool. Dude, appreciate you. Thanks for coming on, man.
Thanks, guys. Have a good one. And that, my people, is the show. Thank you for tuning in. And hey, before you go, if you enjoyed the episode or if you enjoy the show in general, please consider leaving us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. We really do value your feedback and we read the comments. We make future decisions about topics and guests and everything else. Plus, it helps us reach more people the more reviews we get. And last but not least, please head over to social media. Consider friending and following and subscribing to all that stuff at Better Life and my personal page at Beardy Brandon, Instagram, YouTube, and everywhere else. Thank you again for listening. I'm honored that you would bring me along on your journey toward building wealth through real estate investing without losing your soul.